Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a refreshing break. And we move now straight away into our first high-level panel discussion. We've heard a number of rousing calls for stronger interplay amongst policymakers, certification bodies, and standard setters at national and international level. And now we want to drill deeper with our first panel spotlighting the added value of collaboration, basically, and asking what concrete gains broader and deeper integration and interaction can deliver. And specifically, we want to use the next 90 minutes to ask what potential risks and challenges of AI can be addressed through interaction of standards bodies, conformity assessors, and legislators how all these actors are working together at present and where deeper collaboration is both necessary and feasible and also what form it could take, where stronger interaction is needed at domestic level, especially in countries of the global south and how the IEC can help support that, so capacity. And finally, what a platform for ongoing dialogue about AI issues could look like and who can drive its creation and development. Because as was mentioned in our words of greeting from our hosts and organizers, uh, such a platform is uh, under consideration and we'd love to get input for that uh, moving forward. So those are our topics and we have an outstanding panel to address them. And we're also very eager to hear from you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, same uh, procedure as last time. Those who are in the room can use the microphones and those who are on online uh, should please use the chat function. And uh, I will bring the questions in a little bit later on. And I will keep the introductions now very brief in order to maximize our time for discussion. Starting uh, on the other side of the panel uh, with Golistan Sally Radwan, who is advisor to the Minister for Artificial Intelligence at the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology in Egypt. Welcome. Next to her, or actually online, uh, is Salvatore Scalzo. He is policy and legal officer working on AI policy development and coordination at the European Union's digital directorate, DG Connect, and we will see him shortly. Then next to Sally is seated Thomas Schneider. He is ambassador and director of international affairs and international information society coordinator at the Swiss Federal Office of Communication, OFCOM, in the Federal Department of the Environment, Transport, Energy, and Communications. And he also serves as the chair of the Council of Europe's recently established Committee on Artificial Intelligence. I'm also very pleased to welcome seated next to, uh, to Thomas Schneider, Lenora Zimmerman. She's Senior Program Manager for International Standards Development at Google. And finally, it's a pleasure to welcome Bob Joseph Matthew. He's Vice Director and Head of the Legal Metrology Division and member of the Executive Board at the Swiss Federal Institute of Metrology, METAS. Great to have you with us. So a very warm welcome to all of you. And we are going to begin with opening uh, statements, but we've agreed that we're going to perhaps shrink those a bit in order to get into the interactive section of the, of the discussion as soon as possible. So I'll ask each of you, uh, I'll call you uh, one by one, and you may either present from the lectern or hear from your seats to tell us a little bit about what you're doing quite concretely to help build AI with trust and where you need others to achieve that goal. And I'll start with Sally Radwan. Thank you. I'll use the podium. It's just easier that way. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much to the IAC and to the Swiss government for, for organizing this really important conference, in my view, and, and for the invitation, of course. Um, my title slide is, um, you know, supposed to give you a, a bit of an idea about what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but you'll also notice the asterisk next to the word ethics. That's because the word ethics uh, seems to be used interchangeably in this context with things like trustworthiness, uh, but also regulation and uh, openness and transparency and, and various other kind of similar meaning words. Uh, they call it responsible AI in some contexts. So please don't um, restrict what I'm going to say to the strict uh, sense of ethics. Um, <coughs> 
And if I could have the next slide, please. I forgot to take the clicker. I'll, I'll bring it to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I just problem. There you are. You're welcome. So uh, I apologize. This uh, looks like a bit of a vanity slide, but <laughs> it's really uh, just to explain to you the, the perspective from which I'm going to say what I'm saying. Uh, which is uh, until very recently, um, I was uh, leading the development and the implementation of the national AI strategy for Egypt. And while I was doing that, uh, I was also participating as an expert and a delegate in the drafting and negotiation of various of these um, recommendations on ethics and on responsible AI at UNESCO and the OECD. And I, I was also the lead author on our own Egyptian flavor of it called the Egyptian Charter for Responsible AI, uh, which is part of what I'm going to talk about today is the importance of translating these recommendations and guidelines into the local context of each country. But before I worked in government, I was also uh, working in the private sector and a little bit in academia. So I'll be wearing those hats as well a little bit. Uh, but my point is I'll be talking more as a consumer of these um, guidelines and these recommendations and what it really takes to implement them on the ground. Now I'll click away that embarrassing slide and uh, I hope that uh, Thomas is, uh, <laughs> slide is okay just to keep there for the rest of my talk. Um, you can go back to yours also. <laughs> I'm flexible. Um, I'll go back to my slide. Um, right, so uh, let me give you a little bit of a story. It's a slightly hypothetical story, but if you go to a government official in a developing country uh, with any of these recommendations, the UNESCO, the OECD, or any of the many, many really important documents, some of which I helped draft, so I'm, I'm not against them by any means, and you put it in front of them, the conversation will go something like this. Okay, let me tell you about my priorities. I have a 60% illiteracy rate, a 40% poverty rate, a declining healthcare system, increasing crime rates, a very high population growth, and an uncontrollable unemployment rate. How is any of your recommendation going to help me address any of these problems? And that's an actual realistic conversation that I've had with many government officials. So we need to find a way to bridge the gap between how we think about what government officials are supposed to think and how they should act, and between what their actual priorities are, especially in developing countries. And I'm going to talk a lot about de developing countries today because I don't think they get their fair share of the debate. Um, the moral of the story for me really boils down to a couple of points. First, there is no such thing as a global priority. Yes, we have the UN SDGs and we try to align around them, but really each country has its own priorities. We had an AI group within the Arab League and you would think that the Arab world is a fairly homogeneous group of countries. We couldn't agree on priorities for AI. Our priority in Egypt is to use AI for development, so to deploy it in key economic sectors to increase their, their growth. In other countries, they want to increase entrepreneurship and others, they want to promote scientific research. It's very, very different. The second point is the multilateral process is flawed by nature. It's just designed to take away everything that anyone might have a problem with. And then it leaves you with a very, very watered down version of things that everyone finds acceptable, which is not necessarily everything that we all find important. So while it's important to have that basis of the multilateral <coughs> process that is as inclusive as possible, and I must commend UNESCO especially for holding a two-year, very inclusive, very elaborate process full of consultations with countries and individuals and, and different organizations to come up with their recommendation. Uh, the OECD did something very similar, but then you need to translate it into the real world. Um, for example, I can tell you that uh, for the UNESCO recommendation, we got completely two opposing uh, pieces of feedback. The Arab countries, when we did the regional consultation, said, this is very high level. We can't do anything with this. We need a prescription. We need a roadmap. Tell me one, two, three, four, and when I've done those, I've complied with your ethics recommendation. When we took this to the 193 countries of UNESCO, 
and discussed this in the larger group, many countries actually said the exact opposite. They said, no, this is too prescriptive. You're meddling too much in countries' sovereign right to decide what's best for them. So again, we had to find the balance, and that means that it doesn't really work for everyone to 100%. Um, the third point I'd like to make is that um, different entities will develop different guidelines and recommendations that comply with their scope and mandate, uh, whether it's UNESCO with their priorities on gender and Africa and focus on science and, and humanities and so on, whether it's OECD with focus on, on the economy or WHO with focus on, on health and so on. But there is no um, body or no attempt to consolidate all of these and nothing that you can really put in front of a government official and say, here, this is the document. <coughs> and I think this is the first thing that we can start working together on. And there is no better place than Geneva to get that process started, in my opinion. Um, and then finally, developing countries need more help than you think. We cannot assume that all countries of the world have the necessary legal systems, that they have the necessary capacities, human capacities, regulations, and so on, to just implement whatever we throw at them. Um, I always get a little bit anxious when I hear rhetoric coming out of the EU of now we have our AI Act, or previously we have our principles on AI, and now they need to form a basis for everyone's values or everyone's principles on AI. That's a very dangerous message to send to the rest of the world. I have the highest respect for the EU. I have a second nationality, so I'm also, well, not anymore, but I, <laughs> I used to be an EU member until a few months ago. Let's not dwell on, dwell on that, but I, I love the EU. <laughs> but you just cannot expect every country in the world to conform with something that only a few countries have developed. And if you don't believe me, just to close out that argument, then I'll end with uh, a quote from uh, a fellow citizen of uh, a developing country, Ratan Tata, who said, uh, if you want to walk fast, walk alone. If you want to walk far, walk <coughs> together. So I'll stop here and leave the rest to the Q&A. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sally Redwan. And in fact, we had two audience questions that came in for the last panel, but I think I'm just going to throw them at you, but really with the request for the, a, a, a very brief uh, answer, but they did go to the question of how is AI being used now in developing countries to benefit development and or promote uh, fulfillment of the SDGs? Can you just tell us, you know, literally two sentences uh, to, to illustrate that? I can give you a few examples of uh, out of Africa specifically. Uh, in Egypt, for example, we've launched a few projects around the use of AI in agriculture. Uh, so we launched a, um, a smart farmer's assistant that is basically a chatbot as a mobile app uh, that helps the farmer out. And of course, you have to keep in mind the, the user's uh, technology literacy and general literacy in mind as well. So it needs to be voice activated, it needs, needs to be mainly based on images and, and very simple interactions. But it gives them um, very relevant, very personalized advice on what to plant, when and how to irrigate their crops and weather advice and prices of crops and so on and so forth. So this is an example of use in, in agriculture. There are lots of uses in healthcare. Uh, we also develop a, a system for the early detection of um, diabetic retinopathy due to um, complications from type two diabetes, which is a huge problem in Egypt and in many African countries. Um, so I don't want to take up no, more good. time, but there, yeah. are, there are lots of, of different um, applications and examples like that, and I'm happy to provide more if needed. Thank you. In fact, every time we talk about leapfrogging with technology, potentially we're talking about applications of AI. Let me go now to Salvatore Scalzo. And Salvatore, I know you're with us. We haven't actually seen you yet, but I guess we will now. And uh, very grateful to hear your thoughts on our topic. Thanks a lot uh, for the kind invitation, first of all. Uh, and I very happy we, 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 to be with you today, and I apologize for not being there in presence, unfortunately, but I hope still uh, that I can make a useful and valuable contribution to this very interesting discussion. 
I will try to share some slides from my <clears throat> computer, if that is okay with you, so that could steer my presentation. I hope you can see them. Can you see them? Yes. Super. So I will try to present, I mean, we have discussed already about uh, uh, the approach and also ethical implications of AI. From the EU side, uh, we have tried to implement over the last few years, it's part of a more comprehensive strategy on artificial intelligence and approach to AI, which uh, let's say is uh, uh, what we call the uh, human centric. So try to put still uh, recognizes the value and benefits of artificial intelligence, but still recognizes the need to make sure that artificial intelligence will develop with humans at the center of it. And uh, we have promoted and uh, adopted on the 21st of April, 2021, uh, some important documents which substantiate the strategy. Uh, I will focus today on the regulatory part of this, uh, of this uh, package of 2021, which is the proposal for a regulatory framework on artificial intelligence. But it is important to highlight, and I always tend to strengthen that, that this is not the only document of this package, because we also have promoted a, a, a coordinated plan on AI, which serves the purpose also of triggering investments and initiatives within the EU for the purpose of creating trustworthy artificial intelligence. Now, with regard to the proposal for artificial intelligence, the underpinning rationale in the EU is that we acknowledge the benefits of artificial intelligence, but we also believe that AI presents some risks that must be tackled. And addressing the risks related to AI is also fundamental to facilitate, let's say, a strong uptake of artificial intelligence across the different categories of stakeholders. Now, when coming to the artificial intelligence proposal, I want to say, without entering into the technicalities, that we have tried to regulate artificial intelligence along the well-established rules for products within the EU. And why is this important? Notably, as I'm talking to an audience which is also quite familiar with standardization issues, because the system of regulation of uh, uh, the system of regulation for products on the EU internal market is strongly supported by standardization system, and I will come to that later. Our approach towards artificial intelligence, a second important point, is a risk-based approach. We didn't want to regulate artificial intelligence in a disproportionate manner, but we wanted to be to make sure that measures are proportionate depending on the risk of the artificial intelligence system. The third thing, and this connects also to the international dimension, which was mentioned before, we want that our rules create a level playing field for EU and non-EU players, meaning that the rules should be the same regardless of the location and the origin of the operator in question. <clears throat> the first important challenge when coming to artificial intelligence is defining artificial intelligence. From our side, we have tried to build, once again, I won't go into the technicalities unless there are questions, but we have tried to define artificial intelligence based on one of the most uh, uh, trustworthy definitions which were reached at, a, at the international level. So we relied, in fact, on the definition of the OECD for artificial intelligence, which is quite neutral in nature and aims to cover all kinds of artificial intelligence systems, from machine learning to symbolic AI to hybrid systems. And for the purpose of legal certainty, we have listed the technique and approach which are under the scope in our Annex 1. I mentioned before that we rely on a risk-based approach. You can see here uh, uh, that we identified the four risk categories, uh, starting from what is an acceptable risk. So we defined some practices that should be prohibited within the EU. For example, social scoring put in place by public authorities or remote biometric identification systems, which are uh, uh, prohibited practices under the proposed EU framework. Then we have a second level, which is high-risk AI systems, which are systems which are permitted, but are considered to be of uh, uh, significant risks to fundamental rights, health and safety, and therefore some requirements should be complied with before placing on the market. 
The third element, uh, the third risk level is the transparency risk. So uh, systems which are not high risk but present specific transparency uh, challenges such as chatbots, just to make an example, or deep fakes. And finally, the large majority of AI systems which are minimal or no risk. So meaning that we don't set any obligation or requirements. I can tell you that basically in our system, in our proposed framework, only between five and 10% of AI applications being on the market could be considered high risk systems. So we don't touch the large majority of AI systems which are on the market. Now, I want to just to give you a flavor of what is a high risk system under the proposed AI regulation. We took into account a series of criteria to define what is high risk. For the sake of time, I will not go into that, but you have fundamentally two categories which result from this uh, criteria as, uh, which are as defining applications which are high risk. First of all, we have uh, safety components of regulated products that are already subject to enhanced control under uh, sectorial regulation, for example, medical devices or machinery. And the second important, uh, uh, let's say, category of high risk AI systems are what we call standalone AI system in a number of critical areas. You can see biometric identification, critical infrastructure, education and vocational training, employment and workers management, access to and enjoyment of public and private services, law enforcement, migration, administration of justice and democratic processes, which we consider to be critical areas with regard to the use of AI systems. Now, being a high risk system means fundamentally that the AI system before being deployed will have to comply with some requirements. And here you can see the list of the main requirements, which are about quality of data, technical documentation, transparency, human oversight, robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity. Now, uh, I said before, we follow the approach for products uh, that is used at EU level, meaning that harmonized standards can support the operators to comply with the requirements. Basically, the, uh, you can see that in our articles 40 and 41, there can be harmonized standards produced by standardization organizations, which can help, uh, as I said, the operators to demonstrate the compliance with the requirements of the framework. When harmonized standards are not there or are not considered to be sufficient, the regulators could, but this would be on an exceptional basis, produce common specifications which are similar technical, technical specifications similar to standards, but adopted by regulators. But this is, once again, a possibility which is only considered in an exceptional circumstance. The, the normal role for operationalizing our requirements, the normal uh, way tool to operationalize our requirements would be in fact the harmonized standards. And here you can see, I guess this is quite familiar to the people who deal with standardization system, notably at EU level. Basically, our regulation defines requirements at a high level. The technical solutions, as I indicated, are expected to provide by standards. And the European standards, just to say that in a nutshell, can provide when they are published by the Commission in the official journal of the EU, they can provide a presumption of conformity with the requirements of the regulation. So de facto, providing the manufacturer with a level of reassurance, of legal reassurance that they comply with the regulation. So as you can understand, according to this model, the role of standards is quite key because in fact, standardizers have the fundamental responsibility under, of course, the commission supervision to lay down and operationalize the requirements of the regulation into implementable and practical technical solutions. I wanted just to present briefly in my last two minutes, the ongoing work of standardization. Now, given this background, which I think it is important also to frame the work on standards, I think uh, uh, you easily understand how the standardization work will be crucial over the next few years, because we will need to have good standards in place by the time the regulation is applicable. Now, uh, as to the timeline, because sometimes I receive the question, when this act will be applicable? We don't have the crystal ball because uh, uh, the, in 2021, we presented a proposal and now a negotiation process is ongoing, which uh, anyway, between the two, 
institution, the two co-legislators within the EU, the Council and the Parliament, our estimation for the moment is the possibility to conclude the work over the next year, so in 2023, and then the Commission has foreseen a two-year transitional period. So under this scenario, we would expect the new rule to be possibly applicable in 2025, at some point in 2025. By then, we will need good standards to help operators in relation to the requirements. So we have carried already now as to the activities, good mapping research to get necessary data on the ongoing standardization activities. We have committed to strong engagement with European and international standards organization. And we are also preparing a first standardization request to the European standardization organization to be adopted already this year. You may be also aware that we are conducting important bilateral negotiations to increase also our cooperation in standardization without prejudice to the general work already undergoing in international standardization organizations. For example, there are also a strong at the moment uh, interaction with the US in the context of uh, TTC, technology and trade cooperation, which is also on standards for AI. And finally, AI was also chosen as a test case within the EU to improve the standardization system, which means that we will have a strong interest and strong tool to mobilize stakeholders and experts around the topic of AI standardization. And now, maybe more specific, but I prefer to give you a full picture of what we are doing. There is an upcoming standardization request, which will be addressed to the standardization organizations, just to say that this will be on the technical areas, areas linked to the requirements of the framework. It will focus on risks which are horizontal across AI systems, and we want a strong involvement of SMEs and civil society organizations, because we recognize that good standards, particularly in the field of AI, should benefit from the diversity of the inputs and the contribution, the need for the contribution of all the different stakeholders whose interests should be appropriately and adequately reflected and represented. With that, I would conclude my presentation and I hope I could provide you with a grasp of the things we are doing and uh, let's say the challenges we are going to face over the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Salvatore Scazzo, for that very granular look at where the EU is going. And we go now to Thomas Schneider, who will give us a, a, a Swiss perspective. Thank you. Can you hear me? So let's see how this works. Which are, yep. Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas. I work for the Swiss Federal Office of Communication, and I'm happy to see my former boss again because I was working for eight years under Philip, who is now, uh, who you've heard before. Um, I'm actually not necessarily focused on a Swiss perspective, but I'm trying to bring in a tool that hopefully helps to create trust and then uh, ask a few questions on how we can work together to make this, to make this actually work. Um, in order to create trust, we need rules. That's um, the same for uh, traffic or what, what, uh, car traffic or whatever you do. And there are different kinds of rules. There are technical rules, norms and standards. There are legal rules. There are also cultural rules and norms and standards and, and so on and so forth. I will focus on, on an instrument that is a legal instrument. We've seen uh, a rise of soft law in various um, international fora like OECD, UNESCO, Council of Europe and others in the last years. Um, we do have existing legislation on national level, on, on international level, that also applies to AI, at least to the extent that we agree if and how it applies. There are other guidance instruments like national strategies, uh, and we just heard one uh, um, proposal of something that's in, that is in the pipeline in the EU. Uh, I know that in the US people are discussing the, an AI Bill of Rights um, in, in some circles at least. But the big question behind it, and it has been alluded to by, by some already, is what do we actually want? What kind of rules do we want? And then the question behind this is basically, what is the world that we want to live in? What are our shared values that we want to have? And then how to develop a system that helps us to make sure that these shared values are actually followed and implemented. And I think the Council of Europe as an institution and a concrete tool that I'm quickly going to talk about is something that can contribute to creating trust. Because, and for those that may confuse the Council of Europe with the European Union, this is not the same. 
Uh, the Council of Europe is like the UN of Europe. It has also been created after the Second World War. It is larger in membership. It's currently 46. And it has an outreach also beyond, um, beyond uh, Europe. It is also based on a system of values based on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. But it has, unlike the UN, it has an institutionalized framework. It has a court of human rights where any citizens of a country, of a member country can go and appeal to, and then uh, the decisions of the court have an effect on the legislation of the particular country. And the soft law that is created, the parliamentary assembly recommendation, everything is taken into account. So it's a whole system, um, a coherent system that actually tries to not just produce nice papers, but implementable rules. And it also has a very flexible system of of treaties, of conventions, framework conventions, partial agreements that are able to uh, encompass a wider range of countries than just its membership. For instance, you may know the, the, the Cybercrime Convention, the Budapest Convention that has lots of uh, signatories from outside Europe, and it has more than 100 countries that are at least, even if they haven't signed and ratified it, in, influenced, inspired by the principles and the mechanisms guided there. So this is one of the elements that I think makes the Council of Europe an institution, a system that helps to create trust because it has clear values, but it also has mechanisms to enforce them. And uh, with regard to AI, the Council of Europe has started years ago on developing sec sectorial guidance for the media sector, where, for instance, my, my office is, is participating in the judicial system and so on. But it was considered that this is not enough, that we should somehow have a little bit of a horizontal approach across all the sectors and so it was a, there was another committee that was started that did an analysis and came up the conclusion that we do have existing legislation that applies to AI, but that may not be enough because there are substantive and procedural gaps where you not really know how to apply something that you think you should. There are uneven protection levels because some things are traditionally covered by existing legislation where new things that do the same may be, not be. This in turn creates uncertainties also for the industry. They don't know uh, who's liable. They, it's difficult to invest if you're not clear about the legal uh, liabilities, about the risks. And of course, uh, as we all know, soft uh, law has uh, some limitations. So the question is, what is needed now? What is needed from a Council of Europe perspective based on the values of human rights, democracy, and rule of law? And the feeling was of that expert group that it should not be just it cannot be one instrument, it needs to be a combination of binding instruments, non-binding instruments. It must be a combination of something that is transversal, that goes all across whatever is defined then as AI. But the devil is in the detail and you need to uh, produce sectoral instruments that are building on the traditions in the sectors in order to somehow meaningfully protect human rights and allow innovation at the same time. And um, it also needs a, a, a mechanism to then implement the principles or the guidance that you put on paper. It needs to have mechanisms to assess risks, to assess impacts, and also to make sure that there are incentives that make actually countries, which are the addressee of the Council of Europe, to follow uh, these guidance. So that was the, the outcome of the CAHI, the, the first committee. And these, what you see, is the potential elements that could be in a legally binding instrument a framework convention or a convention, of course, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to have some fundamental principles. They will not be uh, uh, absolutely revolutionary new. Risk classification, we've heard this impact assessment is not exactly the same, but you somehow need to know, is something really a problem or is it not a problem? Do we have to regulate it at all? Another question is, do you have to have specific regulation for private, uh, for public sector activities because you cannot just use another service because maybe your, your government or municipality has a monopoly in some ways over your life. And of course, you need to have safeguards if your rights if, if are violated, if there's harm that happens, and you need to know who's liable. And then the interest, most interesting thing actually is then the implementation and compliance mechanism. How do you actually make sure that this is followed? So the task of the, of the new committee that, uh, that I'm uh, chairing now is to produce a legally, probably a, it's called officially still an appropriate legal instrument. It's most probably going to be framework convention on the development, design and application of artificial intelligence systems based on the Council of Europe standards. And the important thing, and I hope to make a bridge here to, to uh, what, uh, what you have said, 
this is the process itself, but also the, the signature ratification of the outcome is open, not just to member states of the Council of Europe, it's open to any country in the world that shares the same values and is willing to participate in the process and then to sign. And, and this is new for something in the, uh, of, of this in the Council of Europe, but it has grown over time that there's a feeling that this is necessary. Um, any observer uh, from the technical community, from business, from civil society, from academic community can apply uh, to be an observer, to participate, because it was felt that uh, governmental representatives and lawyers alone will probably not be able to develop a, a legal uh, standard that is actually appropriate and makes sense and is implementable. So we need that cooperation um, between all stakeholders, which is the direction. Uh -huh. And so what we are discussing now, and the work has just begun based on the previous work, are questions like this. What is AI? What is AI not? Is AI a technology or is it rather a concept that drives different technologies to somehow function together. What is the harm? What is the scope of this particular legal instrument? And there you have questions like, okay, the Council of Europe is, is not, has no mandate for, for uh, military uh, activities. So what about dual use uh, applications? Where to draw the line? What about national security and national defense or whatever you call it? How exactly? It's nice to talk about risk assessment and risk impacts. How do you do this? Um, we are now talking not just only about human rights impact assessment, which is something that is more or less known, but we are trying to develop a human rights democracy and rule of law impact assessment, Uderia, which is a little bit more complicated even. And, and the final one is then, how do we make sure that whatever we develop is actually implementable and is also acceptable so that ideally it's, it's followed by as many uh, uh, countries in, in the world? And the answers are simple, but not so trivial in doing. We need to work together. We need to work together, all stakeholders, because we need to have a shared understanding, again, in what society we want to live in, what, are the, what is the basic shared vision, what are our values, what are our fundamental rights? Do we have to draw red lines? If so, yes, maybe we don't. Um, how do we assess the risks? And one of the most important ones is when it comes to cooperation. What are our respective roles? How do we have to work together? Um, governments, but also within governments, those responsible for the judicial system, those responsible for protecting freedom of expression, um, those responsible for social security, but also technical standardization bodies, civil society. How do we need to work together to come up with a coherent whole that ideally somehow works and is applicable to all cultures and all societies in the world? And it's not just the experts dialogue. For this one, we have the IGF, the UN Internet Governance Forum, for instance, to mention one, or the AIF a Good Summit, which we are also supporting uh, it happening here in Geneva. How do we make sure that the decision makers understand and that in a country like ours, where people have the last word, as you should, how do we make sure that people understand what this is about? And finally, <coughs> how do we adapt the way we work, the way technical standards are made, but also the way laws are made? It may be a little bit difficult if we take 10 years to develop a new law in an area where things are changing maybe every, every five months. So, there's a lot of questions that I'm hoping to get some answers from you. What is clear to me in the end is that if we deal with uh, artificial intelligence, we need all our brains, we need our collective human intelligence. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> very interesting indeed. <coughs> Lots of <clears throat> questions. Bob Joseph Matthew, you're up next. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be invited to present here today because uh, I think it's actually, you know, apparently I'm belonging to the expert panel, but actually I think we are all here to become more experts in the due course of this event. So what I'm trying to do in the, in the short run now here is actually to try to give you some ideas of how the instrument of conformity assessment could be used that's to build trust, but also just to, to, to emphasize how important it is that the various stakeholders support each other. But first, let me give you an example why building trust is key to reap the benefits of AI systems. Perhaps some of you have heard about this story, I don't know. So 
This was published uh, a few years, uh, sorry, a few months ago, and it goes very, very well along with uh, the citation of, uh, of Stephen Hawking, the best or worst things to happen to humanity can be AI. So what has happened concretely was that uh, scientists took a machine learning model that they had trained to find non-toxic drugs, non-toxic drugs. But what they did as a test, they just changed one function, saying that it, it should not lo look for non-toxic molecules, but also for toxic molecules. They let it run for six hours. And what turned out overnight were they found 40,000 of toxic, very toxic molecules, which were similar to the VX nerve gas, which is one of the most deadly gases you can imagine. So the story illustrates quite well how, how things can go wrong if you just simply tweak a little bit the whole concept that you have thought of. It is also showing something else that besides the growing priority of dual use concerns that you have in scientific research, that is also important that, and that's why this fora is really, really good, that, that you share information and that you share also information in research, but also at the same time that you think about what you should be sharing and what not, because it can be dangerous. In this report that the scientists published, they didn't disclose all the necessary detailed technical information because of the worry that this could be misused. However, it shows that in, in areas of, as such, for instance, national security, AI safety experts, biosecurity experts, or regulators should work together, or phrase it very simple, in general, entities need to work together for establishing adequate safeguards. Talking about adequate safeguards, there was a study on the drivers of trust or a specific study that was published by uh, the University of Queensland in Australia and the KPMG unit in Australia. They conducted a five country study on the topic of trust in AI. Citizens in Australia, the US, Canada, UK, and Germany participated in this survey. The, the study tried to understand what the citizens were thinking about trust and expectation. And this was a study, as I said, about, across multiple countries. The questions were around general trust in AI system, but also focusing on healthcare and HR applications. But I would like to highlight now our two findings that came out of the report. One is, and I thought it's quite interesting to see the confidence they have in entities to regulate and govern AI. So here from your side on the, on the top left, the first graph shows that the citizens have the most confidence in their national universities and research institutions, as well as their defense organizations, which was a little bit astonishing to me <laughs> at the first sight. <laughs> However, they, if you compare with the rest, they don't really, well, not really. I mean, the first group, they were trusting them between 67 to 73%. But on the other hand, only 54 to 58% had confidence in commercial organization and governments. The explanation they gave in the study was, <laughs> These are the ones who want to make everything more efficient. That's, <laughs> so well, an ex, the expectations perhaps according, uh, related to bureaucracy as well, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, in any case, confidence in entities dealing with AI and des designing adequate regulation varies, as you can see. However, adequate regulation is important, and this is actually shown in the that model that you have in the bottom right from your side. So the first outcome is that the belief in current safeguards is and that they are adequate makes the use of AI safe. That's what they believe. Perceived impact on AI, of AI on jobs is, is another factor that in, has a, an impact on trust as well as familiarity and understanding of AI. On the other hand, the negative driver is the perceived uncertainty about AI. So the black box issue, that's what they're talking about. But the majority believe the, the biggest or most important driver are current safeguards. So the current safeguards are the strongest factor. And one building block in, for the current safeguards are besides regulation also could be conformity assessment. Conformity assessment is, is actually 
per perceived as a, as a way of building trust. It, ha it under is underpinned by principles like transparency, fairness, uh, can, can deal with accountability, privacy, etc. However, the most important thing about conformity assessment is that it is there to protect and ensure through norms and standards that certain conformities is given for any product or for any type of software. The conformity assessment in general could, could look like this. We had before a, a broader and a deeper explanation by our colleague from the EU Commission. I don't want to go in detail in, in, into that uh, proposal, but what is important to understand is it's a generic model. You have a partner, so you have a conformity assessment, and then you have market surveillance as well. This is the way today in the EU it is used for certification of products, for in, like electric city meters or, uh, or uh, water meters, pump stations, etc. But what is important is that you have after after the conformity assessment, you have the market placement, and only once you have shown demonstrated conformity, you can put your uh, your product or your uh, software on the market. So what is important to understand is that you actually you could use this concept for the design and development of an AI system, be, meaning that from the conceptual phase till the validation and evaluation is done, you have seven, certain points where you have to deliver clear clear uh, uh, demonstration of the skills and of the of the of the functionalities of, of this tool that you are doing and designing. But it's important, this context has been mentioned as well several times, is actually the mapping against risks. So I don't think that every each and every application should go through a conformity assessment, but you need to understand which risks you want to you want to address. What is important though is that uh, once you decided to do so that you have uh, the requirements in place for the quality of data used, the technical documentation and record keeping is guaranteed, transparency, the provision of information to users is, is given, how you handle the human oversight, the accuracy, also cybersecurity is very important nowadays, and the robustness and fit for person, purpose. So it's basically a functional explanation that has to be given with it. However, the other part, market placement and the market surveillance, I think is, is very important as well, because constant evolution of a system requires that you somehow monitor constantly. So this should be in place and verified on a regular basis. <clears throat> Depending on the risk, you could actually define the intervals longer or shorter. This is a key concept that you use nowadays already. However, what is also important and what comes with it is also that in my view, the industry or the operator of such tools should have certain obligations like that. They have to have a monitoring system, a QMS system in place, and they have that they show they have competent and qualified people to monitor as well, and not that they let it loose. Where, but it, if I summarize it, at the end of the day, you can only manage something that you can measure. So why do we need each other? Many things have been said already. I, to a certain extent, risk to repeat what have others have, have said, but adequate regulation safeguards drive trust, as I showed you with one of the previous slides. Uh, I also thought it's not only regulation as such, but of the co a code of conduct, we need to think about these kind of things and principles that you agree upon. What is absolutely necessary is a need for a multiple multidisciplinary approach, which has also been shown by, by Thomas and other speaks before that because the use cases that are or the or frameworks that exist are highly contextual and require high dis interdisciplinary expertise. And this asks specifically for multi stakeholder collaboration. Further, I think all those that I mentioned, industry, national and international authorities, as well, academia, each have a key role to play. Industry, not only that they show conformity with the requirements, but they also document, monitor, exchange the information. So authorities regarding regulation, political decisions have to be taken as well. Further, academia what considers research, considers 
information sharing or the promotion as well towards the people to make them understand how important this play, they have a role to play as well. And that's why I think we all need to work together. Principles and risk framework need to be discussed also amongst these stakeholders and others. What I think is important as well is that AI, AI literacy of stakeholders at all levels need to be increased, that we all need to work on that on every level. So from consumers to regulators, everyone needs to be educated. And the, the study from, from Australia shows that there is certainly a lack in that. And last but not least, and this goes a little bit along the lines with what you just were saying, you were talking about standards. And, uh, prom and I think promote common standards to achieve mutual recognition worldwide is key. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And appropriately, we now go to a technology company that was interesting <laughs> to see where the, the trust resides in the, in the moment uh, in regard to technology companies, probably not too surprising to a lot of us. But uh, <laughs> anyway, Lenora Zimmerman, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I am going to remain seated so that we can go right into having a conversation amongst each other and hopefully get a lot of questions from the audience. Um, so I have had some really great lead in, uh, one from immediately from you on standards, and then from basically others on my panel, others this morning. Um, I am a member of SC42, which is um, uh, the subcommittee part of JTC1, which um, is a technical committee on information technology between IEC and ISO. And so I participate heavily in the standards actually being developed in SC42 on AI. Um, a lot of what we have heard today has been around, how do we work together? What are the different perspectives? Um, you know, when you were speaking, it was, you know, one of the things you had on your slide, I believe, was how do we even define what AI is? What's AI? What's an AI system? Is there a difference? Um, you know, when Sally was speaking, um, you know, you were mentioning, um, you know, it's not all, pardon, it's not all about uh, Europe or the US or the developed world in a sense, but what about what about those, those other countries or underserved areas and populations? And how do we develop standards that can actually, one, address the, the risks, the issues, the societal impact and concerns <coughs> that people have and that's on our minds and that our governments care about, you know, society cares about, et cetera, but while making sure that it's applicable to all. And that is one of the things that is intrinsic to what we do in, in ISO SC42 is it's a collaboration. I think right now um, the numbers are there's over 250 um, individuals globally who participate that represents, I believe, 50 different nations. Um, and it's, and it's, open to any nation. So it's not just, you know, the Western world or what you would consider developing countries. It's, it, 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 it's everybody. Um, and so we work together on a consensus-based process to think through, well, what are the frameworks we need? What are the principles that we should be considering? I've heard the word framework and principles multiple times today. And it all comes down to that. It's, there are issues, AI is a very quickly um, developing area. It's constantly innovating. I mean, AI in and of itself is constantly learning. Um, and that, I mean, so how do we develop standards that are future-proof in a sense? It's never gonna be perfectly future-proof, but how do we get all the key stakeholders together? And those stakeholders include data scientists, ethicists, um, regulators, uh, or like individual organizations, I mean, mine, others, how do we all come together to determine what do we need, what's right for society, what's right for individuals, and how can we do it in such a way that it doesn't impede innovation, but it also takes into account that these standards have to be used and, and uh, utilized by organizations of all sizes and types. And the same goes for countries of all sizes and types. Um, 
And then, uh, and then where do we go from there? And so listening to everybody this morning talk and listening to my other panelists talk, it seems like, you know, we're all on the same page. We all understand that there's a need there and we all desperately want to address it. And I think the critical thing is that we make sure we're all working together so that you don't have any one uh, country or government or organization creating something that could conflict or be duplicative of what's going on elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think us coming together and figuring out how do we define what are those core things that we should all be addressing and to meet the needs of you know, society and industry, et cetera, how can we come together and build that consensus and develop those, uh, I guess you can call like baseline standards that can then be used for conformity assessment and hopefully be used as an input to future regulation, et cetera. So that's, that's a, then we'll come. is it, I guess my mic is now on. Okay, very good. Um, <laughs> That is a wonderful question. And let's just leap right in uh, to the dialogue uh, on the back of that question. Because essentially, you know, you talk about non-duplicative. When I hear Thomas outlining the Council of Europe's thinking at the moment, it looks like there is a lot of overlap with the uh, AI package of the EU. And of course, the Council of Europe is a different body from the EU. Um, maybe you can tell us two things. First of all, where would your framework potentially differ from uh, what, what uh, Salvatore Escazo took us through? And then how are you working with, say, the EU? Uh, where is there additionality or you know, where are you making the most of synergies? Because in some ways, an, a, a lay person observing this could think, are you in competition with each other? Um, so how do you see that? To very quickly answer, um, the key point is it's, as we call it in Germany, it's on a completely different flight level. <laughs> Basically what the EU does, they are regulating market. They are responsible for mainly. And what the Council of Europe does, it has fundamental values of, of human rights, democracy, rule of law, and then it develops principles that need to be respected. People's rights that need to be respected, democratic governance processes that need to be respected. And such a, such a convention will identify such principles, will apply them to AI, and then leave it up to the countries that they develop laws on their own that respect these principles. There will maybe some guidance on whether you need kind of what kind of monitoring mechanisms, whether you need something like we have with the, with the data protection authorities also for AI, but they will not tell you how to do this or how exactly this should look like. So that is, that is the idea. So that is, it's not a competition, it's actually complementary because the Council of Europe cannot do what the EU does, but the EU can also not necessarily do what the Council of Europe does because it's on a different level of principle. It's also on the longer term. If you look at the Council of Europe Convention on Data Protection, that was from 1981 or 82, and it holds for more or less 40 years on a principle basis. Now they revised it. It's something that is complementary to the GDPR, but not necessarily a, a competition. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Let me see whether Salvatore Scalzo, oh. you can hear us, I assume, Salvatore? Yes, very well. Yes. Is that, yes, okay. Um, could you tell us again with this question about how do we work together and where do we work together, including uh, in a platform of some kind, who would you consider to be the key partners and interlocutors for the a EU as it goes on this, uh, down this journey? Um, who, who absolutely needs to be on board when you are trying to be collaborative moving forward? Uh, thanks for the question. I think uh, it is a bit difficult to say who is the ideal uh, partner in the sense that also the EU has, uh, let's say, I mean, first of all, in terms of regulation, of course, uh, I think we tried, uh, uh, this is the a, a clear challenge for the EU because this is the first attempt uh, from the EU side, actually, the first attempt worldwide to build uh, a comprehensive horizontal framework on AI. And we really hope that this could be also be inspiration to as many countries as possible, at least in relation really to the categories of requirements and also the instruments and tools for regulating artificial intelligence. Having said that, from the EU side, we value um, 
bilateral but also multilateral cooperation with uh, uh, with countries that we consider to be like-minded so to have more or less the same vision i know and i agree also with speakers who have said that of course implementation in countries and vision of ai in countries may differ but of course we are hopeful from the eu side that we could find uh, uh, countries that at least share, like the Council of Europe colleague just mentioned, that share the same principles, the general high-level principles with regard to how AI should be used to facilitate and support human activities in a way which does not harm fundamental rights and does not harm the health and safety of people. I think their common grounds could be built and we we look, uh, I repeat, at bilateral and multilateral cooperation in that respect. Just to mention some examples, we had uh, already during my presentation, I mentioned some advanced dialogues at the bilateral level, but uh, we are also very active, for example, at uh, uh, OECD. We are members of uh, uh, clearly also of the, the Council of Europe, and we have been also very active in all the international standardization and European standardization organizations where many countries and regulators worldwide uh, are represented. So in that sense, uh, I mean, I would not say uh, I would not say that we have a privileged uh, place where this could happen. I would say that anyway, the places and there are many, and this is of course an opportunity where uh, AI and principles for AI are discussed worldwide. Tend of course to communicate with each other to make sure that we don't go and we don't take diverging routes, but that uh, of course we find ways to communicate and to bring to convergence. What potential do you see for working together with countries or regions uh, which perhaps uh, take a very different view of certain risks and or would not necessarily subscribe to some of the principles about democratic control and democratic input? Is that, uh, would you say in that case, uh, you don't see potential for cooperation? I mean, this, uh, yeah, thanks. I, uh, I mean, the, the potential for cooperation, I, uh, the potential co co for cooperation, I think in general terms, this is clearly a complicated question because we should then see case by case as to what, uh, let's say, how this, uh, uh, what the problems would be in practice. But uh, uh, of course, we have, uh, I mean, uh, there is always an opportunity for cooperation and try to understand each other and bring views together. At the same time, of course, the EU has clearly laid down, maybe not in an exhaustive manner, but I think that the EU strategy on AI, the coordinated plan and the proposal for a re regulation on artificial intelligence uh, lays down clearly what are considered, at least at EU level, uh, the red lines. Uh, these red lines will have to be hopefully confirmed also by the co-legislators, but of course we will, we will have to move within that frame. And if we, if we will have a regulation that uh, uh, bans certain practices, uh, just to make a concrete example, so consider certain practices to be prohibited, it is evident <clears throat> that cooperation with countries that, uh, you know, may authorize those practices could be difficult, but for obvious reasons, because that would be even, uh, let's say, uh, you know, it would be even illegal for the EU to think of an international commitment which would be against an internal law. That is, I would say, legally evident. Having said that, uh, the opportunity for cooperation remains, and I hope that, uh, uh, that uh, once again, uh, that we find the fora to harmonize our views with countries also on the most controversial issues. Uh, that, that is, of course, our hope, because at the end of the day, we want to make our vision as a uh, the vision of human centric and trustworthy AI as laid down in our proposal as global as possible. That is the hope. Then, uh, yeah, that is and what I can say at the moment. The, the question is very challenging. <laughs> and uh, Lenora, let me, let me go to you uh, with another aspect of that because we have heard calls from companies like Microsoft for regulation so that we don't see a race to the bottom. On the other hand, there is also always a risk that regulation can inhibit innovation. How do you find the right balance there? Or what would you be your position uh, uh, from an industry point of view uh, about how to find that balance? I mean, from an industry point of view, and also, you know, as, as my role as an individual technical expert within SC42, it's, I think ultimately the goal would be that standards are developed before regulations happen. 
That's, that's the, you know, that's the perfect moment is, you know, to develop those first because standards are built on international consensus. And I think, you know, amongst anything that I've done in my career, it's one of the most unique positions, um, you know, that I've been in, in that you have individuals across different technical backgrounds um, and even non-technical backgrounds participating from all different countries across the world, all coming together to build consensus on what do we think is right. Um, and so when you can build that international consensus first and get everyone to agree that, yes, that we think this is the framework we should use to create trustworthy AI, this will give, you know, consumers and society at large more confidence in how AI is being used and developed, then that acts as a really good input for regulation. Um, you know, obviously regulation is going to have slightly different goals and a different slant, but when you can utilize those international standards as an input, then you already know that um, you're starting with a really good baseline. Um, and I think real quick, just to add to the, to the last item, um, is I think a very good example of, uh, you know, trying to deal with situations where you have very differing um, opinions or ideals or just uh, ways that you come to the table when you're trying to develop something is the ethics document, um, the ethics standard that, that we developed in SC42, which hopefully should be published uh, here soon. Um, <laughs> but, that that standard took a couple of years to develop because it is very complicated. How do you agree on what's ethical? What's ethical, you know, to one person might be different to another based on society, based on culture, based on et cetera, you know? And so coming together to agree on what's the baseline from an ethical standpoint on how AI is used and developed what can we agree on that took a lot of work but we finally got there and maybe i can get sally and bob uh to weigh in a little bit on discussions in international standard setting uh, uh platforms or or bodies yeah. what kind of uh cross-cultural cross-regional communication do you experience there sally um Hmm, that's a difficult question. I, first of all, I, I do think that we definitely don't need more siloed attempts at producing more kind of guidelines for the ethical use of AI or whatever. As Lenora just mentioned, it's, it's an excruciating process. It takes years and it's, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it ends up being so watered down because you need to satisfy everyone and you'll never get any, everyone to agree on something that's really substantial where international effort needs to go in the next months and years, in my opinion, is to making those things actionable. So what is the next step after that? How do we work together to implement this? Um, a good example of this is uh, actually going back to UNESCO and the OECD. Uh, the OECD established um, expert groups to figure out how to um, implement its principles on responsible AI. Um, and they started with coming up with a, with a classification of AI systems that is not perfect and will be a work in progress for many, many years. But I think that's definitely a point of convergence around which different um, entities and organizations can come together and can maybe have a comparative analysis of does this particular classification also apply elsewhere? Um, is this something we can agree on? And then I'd like to, to uh, go back to what Ian actually proposed earlier, which is having like a, a common framework of, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember how you phrased it, but it was, it was very elegantly put. <laughs> um, what we all want out of AI that is specific to AI and not to everything else that's been invented, and then start having uh, standards and and um, risk assessments or whatever uh, implementation mechanisms for specific uses of AI, for specific levels of, of risk, for specific classes of AI applications. I think we need to get that granular. Otherwise, we can just keep calling it 
AI because there is no one size fits all. So uh, I think working together on something like classifying AI systems and then uh, looking at them from a, a risk perspective, from an implementation perspective, from a priority for certification and, and standardization perspective, then ultimately going to something like the, the uh, CE process for, for uh, medical uh, device certification in Europe, for example, which does have pretty good categories and is actually used for some AI in healthcare systems today, um, that doesn't stifle innovation, that doesn't harm, uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, if you put a, a cumbersome system in place, it's not Sorry, Lenora, it's not the Microsofts and Googles of the world that are going to suffer from that. It's the five guys in Kenya who are starting a, a startup and, and trying to compete, right? So we need to make sure that it's lightweight, that there is a mechanism maybe for self-assessment and, and, and self-regulation, maybe online certification, things like that. So no cumbersome processes. But also, um, just going back to, to where I started off, uh, agreeing on something like uh, a broad internationally accepted classification of AI systems and what we want to, how we want to regulate each of them. Thanks very much. Let me ask I, Bob to yeah, weigh in as I well. I just take up from where you just stop, because for me, in general, in the organizations that I'm in, the international organization on legal metrology, where you have topics also like digitalization, you should not exclude that because it goes all one in one. Um, principles first and most importantly i think you should be open you have this also that you should not fix it to one group you should have it open from industry to regulators to standardizers just that's one of the key elements and that's already sometimes a political discussion unfortunately secondly i think it's also and there's the big challenge you say you had years to get to agree on certain principles and this will be the challenge on a topic like ai or digitalization in general, because the evolution of technology is much faster than the evolution of the regulation or standardization side. And this is where, where I think everyone battles every day. Further, I, I, I think also that that was an element you brought up is, uh, and that I was also trying to say in my presentation is, you should be careful what we really want to regulate and what we don't want to regulate. I'm not talking about the general principles or ethical principles. I'm talking more about to which extent do we want to let it happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, and there we should apply a risk-based approach, but then you have again, like a more dogmatic conversation or a de debate in these forums where you just say, no, this is not, everything is a risk. If I listen to my mother, everything I did was a risk. But <laughs> that's not the point here. But basically, you have different approaches. And this is something that is really difficult to bring in, into one group. I'm very, as, a, as, a, as an Anglo-Saxon living in Europe, I'm very well aware of the perception that Americans have about Europe, that, uh, or it's certainly about Germany, that everything that is uh, not... Uh, prohibit no everything that is not allowed is prohibited mm, very whereas German, it's so. the other way around of course in the perception of the US uh, and that's essentially <laughs> getting exactly. at, at what you're driving at uh, of course the devil's advocate question would be is AI at the moment so complex and so hard to predict that we can't be sure how great the risks are if we take that that approach if I if I take up perhaps the, the, the study I presented, if you just, there was one element, and this is the uncertainty that people have. And this is, I guess, the scary factor today, because many people cannot explain what's happening. Many people do not know it's related to the principle of transparency. But when, he, when I come back to your question, then journalists, I think we all, to a certain extent, we all have to work on that. We have to educate ourselves. We have to educate all the different stakeholders and the different groups. And that's the only way you can overcome it. Because there's definitely a lot of opportunities with AI, as well as Stephen Hawking said, it could also be the worst nightmare for, for mankind. But I think this is where we didn't talk about a lot about education today here, but I think this is an element where we should all be considering taking it up as an organize presentation also to an audience that is not necessarily aware of what's going on. So it has to reach us to go wider than this, this event. 
Sally, we talked about uh, capacity in developing countries. Uh, what specifically would support developing countries that want to move on with AI and also want to move on with frameworks to govern and or regulate uh, AI? Where, where do you need support? Uh, where does the Global South need support? And uh, can a body like the IEC be helpful there? Um, I think definitely yes. I think we can't rely on the fact that um, developing countries and, and we need to bear in mind that developing countries are not just one entity, right? There are there is even a subclassification within that down to least developed countries. And we can't just open consultation processes to everyone and assume that they're going to participate because some of them literally don't have internet access. Some of them can't afford flights and, and expenses to go attend those meetings. And, and that's a genuine concern for some countries. And so uh, it's important to bear those differences in mind and then to have, um, I think, a, some sort of an assessment tool, which is uh, something also UNESCO is planning to work on as, uh, as a next step to its recommendation. Uh, but I think it can apply to capacity building as well. It's to help countries determine where they are on the spectrum of needing help, so to speak. So in some cases, you need to start at the very bottom where uh, you need to educate government officials on the use of technology. And then you need to go one level up and start discussing digital transformation. And then you need to start educating them about AI. And then you need to see how you can include AI in their legal and regulatory frameworks. In other countries, you have to build up legal and regulatory systems far away from technology even. So it, it varies quite a lot, but I think this is definitely something that a body like the IAC can help with, um, is to start by, by assessing those different needs and mapping them against what they and maybe other bodies as well can help fill the gaps. Thank you very much. And I have an audience question or several audience questions apparently that have come in asking about a global framework and whether all of you would agree that that should be the objective of uh, AI governance is to eventually arrive at, at, at a global framework. So let me essentially ask all of the panel to say just a word about that and who would drive it? What is the, what is the organization uh, that, would, that would drive such a framework? So I'll start with uh, Salvatore, if I may. I think the discussion, uh, <laughs> global framework, ideally, yes, because uh, it is definitely true, as it was highlighted also by the other speakers, that AI is a global challenge. So ideally, of course, a global framework would be the situation also to, to protect, uh, uh, I mean, to, 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 put, to value the potential of AI, but also to protect mankind, just to, to refer to the last speaker, and I think the good remark regarding also the dangers that AI may pose. So, of course, uh, global uh, governance would be ideal. Realistically, I think it would be already uh, a, a good wish if, uh, I mean, uh, at least on uh, some high-level principles, as I said before, there could be as, uh, oh. let's say, as much convergence as possible. I mean, having a common regulation, I think it's uh, probably realistically difficult. Uh, to achieve. But some high level principles, at least on our AI, should be used would be definitely good. How to do it uh, and who should do it? Uh, I think there may be, I mean, some, someone mentioned that there may be a, an interesting role given the work that they have already done, because one of the, and I close on that, sorry for the time, but one of the good surprises when I started to work on the drafting of the regulation and the standardization issues. Uh, on AI is that a lot of work has been done and was mentioned also by previous speakers. So even international standardizations maybe may have a good role to play to help international convergence. So maybe uh, th th there's something to discuss in there. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas Schneider? Yes, I agree with Salvatore that it would be great to have a global system. The problem lies with the implementation. I'm very thankful and we've been participating that UNESCO has managed to develop at least, let's say, a wish list of how things should be. Get that gives an orientation, but they have no means to, they have no strong incentives, let's put it that way, to implement it. So this is why a lot of times with, with uh, a number of conventions, 
It has actually started at the Council of Europe because they have a small group of stakeholders with less diversity, can start something that has then been taken over by global institutions a few years later. This is one thing. If we do, if we would try to already find an institution that is mandated to, to do something about AI, we would probably fight for two generations on whether it's the ITU, UNESCO, or whatever. If it's an intergovernmental institution with standards, it may be slightly easier still. That may also change. <laughs> but um, uh, but I just if, if I'm allowed to make one point, I think that the point is how to bring in how to make all the voices heard from, from those that are not there. And I have 15 years of ICANN, which is an open institution. Right. It's multi-stakeholder. Everybody can join on paper, fine. Mm -hmm. But who has the resources to travel around the world for a week, three times a year? Now they do it also, of course, virtually, but not uh, the, you don't have the coffee breaks so or things get decided. It's to be present, to have... The, the, the resources to study and develop, find out what are actually your interests in an issue, and then to make your voice heard. If you look at ICANN, it's probably, I don't know, 50% of the, of the speaking time is with people from Northern America, then maybe the rest of the 40% is with the other industrialized countries, and then you can decline it to the rest. What I would be interested to see how much is the speaking time divided between uh, industrialized and developing countries in SC42, because just the fact that you're open is one step, but it's just the beginning and not the end to make all people heard. And, and, and my last word is there's something like the UN Internet Governance Forum that yeah. fortunately again takes place in Africa. And of the 200 sessions, probably around like 30 will be on AI like it has been the last years. So this is the occasion for us all to engage, to go to Africa virtually or, 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 or physically even better and, and listen to the voices there. Uh, so we need to use, we may not have the resources to create 50 new platforms, but let's at least use the existing ones and engage and try and understand what the needs are in the different regions. Thank you. Lenora. So one thing that I will say that is, is actually really great about ISO compared to some of the other standards development orgs is, yes, you do have countries like pretty much anybody in Northern America and, you know, Europe who there are a lot of experts, there are a lot of individuals who participate, but the way standards are developed is you hit a certain point where it, and without going into the details, you hit a certain point in the draft of the document where it is no longer a vote at the individual level. Like I can no longer vote myself, it's country level. So even if you're a country with one person, Yes, in, you know, some of the meetings earlier on in the draft, there could be, you know, five people there from the US or, you know, like any other country and you're just one person, but you hit a certain point in the draft of that document where every individual country has a vote and each vote has the same weight. Everybody has the same ability to have their own voice. And also the way the standards are developed is that even if you are that one person earlier in the draft, it's people listen. It's, there's a culture of respect and we all listen to what each other has to say. And yes, you try to do things by a majority consensus, but if you have one or a couple individuals who are consistently like having a differing opinion from the rest of the group, that has to be addressed somehow. You can't just say, well, the rest of us don't agree with you and we're going to move forward. That's not how it works. Now that said, that doesn't address the issue of uh, what if you don't have the resources, even if something is virtual, that still means you need a decent internet connection to participate. And uh, yes, sometimes the meetings are not at great times. I've been on meetings at one in the morning and three in the morning and, you know, but it's, it, it can be difficult for, for many, but at least the structure is set up in such a way that um, everybody's opinion has the same weight. Bob? Yeah, I, I agree that, I agree that uh, we should aim for a kind of a global understanding of what we want. And as Thomas said, I think it, the best would be to have really, or to use an existing platform. However, this platform should have also a clear mandate to go on, to do really that and just to deliver something. Mm. What happens with the implementation afterwards, that's, that's, that's another question. But I think 
that should be a starting point where we just say we have a mandate in that specific platform and that you go ahead to to find a solution or to find a global framework as such but then you have to be careful with mandates though that it's it's once you get into the this is the mandate then it's said well who's driving that mandate who who uh who but defines the, it who puts the scope there it becomes a, it takes a little bit of the consensus yeah. away from it. That's just my perspective. May I ask about another, uh, we're talking essentially here about a top-down approach uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, so is there a possibility that this could happen in a different way, a, a, a bottom-up or an evolutionary approach? And what I'm thinking about is the GDPR and the fact that the GDPR became a model for other societies and systems uh, that perhaps we wouldn't have expected uh, to take take it on. Is that an also conceivable way that you could get at least pieces of this done? Or would we say on AI, it's quite a different situation than on data protection, privacy? Anybody? Um, oh. um, I think yes because frankly, I think it's completely unrealistic to expect a global anything to happen. <laughs> Just what happened, <laughs> like we've been trying for, I don't know how many years. And, uh, but I, I do think the way to achieve that is um, also not on a framework as such, and I'm not sure what exactly is meant by framework here, but um, like I said, a classification mechanism or a standard, to uh, assess the risks of, of AI systems or something. We have a standard on that. Sorry, mm -hmm. that's that's my plug. We got a standard on that. <laughs> something that brings it closer to being implemented, to governments being able to look at it and say, okay, if I'm not in a position to discuss lofty principles, I just want something that is implementable on the ground that they can do something with it. And then they can put their own slant on it. They can add to it, I think that's more realistic than trying to aim for some global approach that I don't think is ever going to happen. Thank you. Just, just a quick remark. Depends on whether you talk about standard setting or whether you talk about dialogue. What dialogue is concerned, the IGF is something that is organized by default, bottom up. There's a call for issues. People can come up with proposals. And then the sessions are organized by the people themselves. There are some criteria, it needs to be multi-stakeholder, it needs to be like globally relevant and, and so on. You need to have people, a certain gender, regional and so on balance. But this is a, it's not a small group that decides, this year we'll talk about this and we'll ignore all the rest. It's people from all over the world that come together and say, this is burning under my fingernails, so I'd like to talk about this. And if there's enough, then there's a session. So this is on the dialogue level, that bottom-up approach and inclusive bottom-up approach exists on the decision-making. It's probably slightly more complicated because somebody will come up with the first draft. And it's normally not <laughs> millions of diverse people that come up with the first draft. Right. So the definition <laughs> power is slightly biased, probably. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. One last question from the audience, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, this is, uh, oh, yes. OK, we'll take that question as well. I do have one here that I'll do very quickly, and then we'll come to you. Um, how will conformity assessment of AI systems look, in your opinion, Bob? So basically, <clears throat> that you have several pro, uh, phases that you have to go through. So if I compare it, it's from the design up to the finishing of the development and testing. So all these phases, you have to decide and con test against specific standards that exist if the conformity is given. But as I said initially, the main thought behind it is just really, do we need to regulate each of the, of the applications? So the first thought is which is showing us a certain risk and then you should go for it. But to be very structured, it's really like from the design or over the evolution of the, of the development up to the, to the testing that you should do this and to have documented, have a QM system, et cetera, et cetera, in place. And we will be able to dive deeper into that tomorrow when we do <coughs> the use cases, because they will, we, there we're going to look at specific risks. Please. Yeah, so on your question about GDPR and whether it kind of provides a model, um, I think we do actually have a very good example um, of, of that exact solution. 
um, with the work that was done in SC27, ISO IEC SC27, with the development and publication of, and I don't wanna say it's just one standard, it's um, what I like to call an ecosystem of GRC or governance risk and compliance standards. So the kind of the, the center of that ecosystem is ISO IEC 27701, otherwise known as PIMS or Privacy Information Management System. And then that has um, corresponding and supporting standards for risk management, privacy impact assessment, um, privacy governance within organizations. As we were developing um, PIMS, we actually heavily mapped to GDPR as we were writing it. There are public facing tools with that mapping available. A lot of the same people are now working in SC42 on 42001, AIMS, the AI information management system, doing the same thing. Currently doing work to map to the AI draft, um, the AI Act draft in the EU. And we have ongoing work on the uh, AI risk management standard. There is a new work item being proposed that has just been approved for an AI impact assessment standard. There's an AI governance standard that has just been approved. So again, that ecosystem of governance, risk and compliance standards with a management system standard at its center that was really successful in, in you know, helping organizations kind of get ready for GDPR, be able to demonstrate compliance with GDPR. I think that it's going to, to offer kind of a roadmap for how to do that with AI as well. Thank you. Just some Thanks insight very much. On that. Yeah. Any other question in the room? Go ahead, please. And do thank remind you. us who you are, please. Yeah, thank you. Wolfram Zeitz uh, with IEC. I'm working with the conformity assessment side of IEC. Um, my question would be, um, I fully agree to the observation that um, AI is a, a global challenge. <clears throat> now, my question to the panelists would be, do you see that similar in the conformity assessment side? We heard from uh, Thomas Schneider, the reference to international standards to allow for that. We heard the reference from Bob Joseph Matthew <coughs> that common standards or international standards would lead to mutual recognition. But how do you see the need for a international conformity assessment system versus regional or national conformity mm -hmm. assessment systems? Thank you. I think that's for you, Bob. Yeah, so I'm happy to <laughs> start because it's I'm happy to start it's and it will come. Um, thank you for the question because uh, I see it in other areas as well. The question is always, for instance, if you have in the area of measuring instruments, so, uh, if you have uh, something that is, let's say, put placed on the market in a specific region outside of Europe, the question already starts. And the, 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 the problem today is the recognition of other, other uh, decisions. However, it goes also a little bit along the, the belief in trust and so on. But yes, I believe we should do that. However, and there we come back again to have common standards because I give you another example. AI or in general, things are not done only locally anymore. The impacts are going across the border. And that's the main reason for me why you should have it. So set so it's like, you know, you don't even know where the cloud is or where the servers are standing. It might not even be anymore in Europe from our perspective. It could be somewhere else and so on. So the, the, the situations, the, the, the cases are actually international as such, not regional anymore. And therefore, I think well, I support the idea of having a system of, of international certification. If I may, may quickly add, it, it depends on, on also there on what it exactly is, because if the situation in a particular sector is completely different from one region to the other for climate reasons, for instance, if it comes about liability or whatever, or for, for cultural reasons, then it may not work. Ideally, of course, we would all have the same rules for everybody, 
but to some extent, we, we also have to allow for diversity. And, and that even goes for, for, for Europe and even for this small country uh, that where the urban people maybe sometimes have a little bit of a different life than the rural people. But it depends on the application, of course. So that's <laughs> actually, you know, Kim kind of stole some of my thunder there, but... <laughs> That's okay. That's actually, so ISO 42001, which is the AI management system standard. That is actually like one of the things that it does. It's meant to allow for conformity assessment and audit to be done against it, but it also allows for a risk-based approach. So it's not just a standard that includes here are all the controls you must comply with. It's a, here's a baseline of the things that that you should be doing from a management system perspective. And then here's a set of controls that we suggest everybody follow. However, you have to start with that risk assessment because it's gonna be different depending on how you use AI and what products and services you have and what data you're using, et cetera, et cetera. And so it allows for that flexibility of use based <laughs> on you know, like how it's being used, who it's being used by, et cetera. Let me see. Let me see if Salvatore is also still with us. Because he gave us that roadmap, essentially, uh, where the conformity assessment was part of it. Salvatore, can unfortunately we can't see you. So, are you still with us? Yes. Awesome. Yes, you are. Okay. I'm very sorry can you, because can you hear. Yes, now we can hear you. Um, did you hear the, the question that was posed basically about whether we need an international conformity assessment uh, body or approach? I'll, I mean, uh, I can say, of course, from the EU perspective, we are about to set a regional system for conformity assessment. So I bring a perspective of uh, of, uh, um, of a prospect European of a possible future European regulation, which will set a conformity assessment system for placing an AI system on the EU market. Having said that, uh, we will ask the details and the technical solutions, as I said, also for the conformity assessment process will come from harmonized standards. And in that respect, I sincerely hope, because that is usually the way the Europe, Europe approaches standardization, that the most of the standardization that uh, will support the future conformity assessment process under the future EU rules for AI will come from international standardization. That is our sincere hope. So in that sense, I see a strong bridge between uh, uh, the European conformity assessment system and international standardization. Now, this is from the standards perspective. Now, if you ask me whether there should be an international conformity assessment process, it's, it's another story. And I, and I think honestly, from uh, experience also in other products, this is uh, quite unlikely. Usually countries that have similar regulations uh, may be put in place mutual recognition agreements when they trust each other's conformity assessment. That is what usually happens. But if already, the EU system for conformity assessment will be supported by international standardization that will, in my opinion, already provide the strong ground for future arrangements between countries to recognize possibly each other's conformity assessment. That is how realistically I see this issue. Thank you very, very much. And I'm afraid we will have to leave it there. I'm so grateful to all of you for this very far reaching and insightful debate that has given us lots to think about and talk about. And the great thing is that that conversation can continue outside where there <laughs> will be a reception to which you are all invited. And we will all see each other back here tomorrow, 9 a.m., when we will do a deep dive on use cases and, of course, carry all that we've been talking about into a very granular look at applications of AI in different sectors <coughs> and what that means for this crucial interplay mission between legislators, uh, regulators, uh, conformity assessors, and standards development bodies. So many thanks. Let's give our panel a warm round of applause. And thank you to the audience as well for your attention and your contributions and uh, see you outside. <laughs>